In the years leading up to the American Revolution, one man sowed the seeds of revolution simply by changing men's hearts. This Englishman sparked the embers of revival in England. Then he brought it to America, where the flames swept like a wildfire. His dramatic storyteller sermons drew thousands of followers throughout the colonies from New England to Georgia. Vast seas of crowds who gathered outdoors became converts after hearing him explain about the new birth we can have in Christ. The pulpits of the churches were closed to him in both England and often in America. Yet he reached into many of these churches and from the pastor to the parishioner, entire churches were saved and transformed. George Whitfield was responsible for changing the way Americans thought about God, the church, their liberty and equality, and by doing so, transformed a nation and the world. George Whitfield, what a story, Doug. Let's get right into the program today on the second half of as we're in our study on George Whitfield. But I want to pick it back up on something that we talked about on last week's program and is really in, let's go back to the fact this guy, he, he grew up in England and he grew up in a bar. He was born in a bar and then he, he made it through to Oxford, had several encounters, and then he starts preaching. The church kind of closes its doors to yep. him, but yet he's having great results outside mm -hmm. the church. And you know how much I love that, yep. how he's doing stuff outside the church and he's seeing results. And then he decides things are going so great, he comes to America. Why? Well, I mean, I thought that too, because he was, I mean, he was the rock star of the day. He preached to over 1 million people in the London area, uh, but it was a spiritual thing. It was that prophecy that we had mentioned. A, 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 and he saw that Christianity had to move west and go to the colonies. And he was about to take that experience that had changed him because he knew it would change individuals and even change the whole country. So, uh, so he, he gets, how did he get, did he, you know, he didn't hop on a 747 and pop over. You know, he had to take another ship. <laughs> no, you know, no. On a, on a voyage. He would, because uh, he was invited uh, by the, the Wesley brothers on his first trip. He made a number of trips, seven of them. Uh, I mean, he spent three years so on the really boat. So he really stayed in contact with the Wesleys. He did. All of that. It, I, mean, I mean, they had their agreements and, and some of their, their, their yeah, yeah, but they were for each other. And, uh, but they knew that the preaching of the new birth was something they could a, 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 a agree on, yeah. So, so he comes to America and so what happens when he gets here? Well, he starts to preach. An amazing thing um, happens is that he, he goes to the highways and in byways. On one of his trips, he preached to half a million uh, um, ind individuals. He was tireless and um, he would have large crowds. Now, it wasn't just the preaching, but he, he met a man called, called Benjamin Franklin because he was the co-signer of um, the, the, uh, the, the Declaration of Independence. But, but Benjamin Franklin, he was a printer. He was a businessman and he'd heard about this, um, this up and coming um, evangelist in, in England. So they got together and he printed all his sermons. And even when Whitfield was not preaching, his sermons were, uh, they would actually read them in churches and have revivals. Reading his sermons, they would actually. Yeah, have yeah. You know, you touched on something last week about, you know, printing it was the social media of the day. The quickest way to get your thoughts out to the world was to go print it up and that's why the printing press was so important. It was, it was. You know, to the evangelism of the day and all that was happening. So, so he's he's there, but I mean, obviously he had he had quite a he came into quite a following for fairly quickly. What made him so? Why did people want to hear him? What was yeah. so exciting? Yeah. Well, um, it wasn't an accident that people they wanted to to, to I mean to hear him. He was methodical in going out. He was the, I mean, he preached everywhere. He got his sermons out there. There was the natural side, but there was the supernatural side. He preached, he would read his Bible on his knees and, and he said sermons would come to him. So he would feed from the living bread of the word right. of life and he would give that out. So he, he, he wasn't just a sermonizer. It was, 
Um, it fed him and he fed others. So I believe, yes, there was the side he, I mean, he was the Mel Gibson of the day. You remember the movie, The Passion of the sure, Christ, sure. and that scene which just impacted everybody where Jesus was being whipped. And there was a lot of, 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 uh, of, of, um, of, of criticism over that because it was so graphic. Yes. But uh, Gibson said himself, I had you know, to tone it down. But if you imagine Whitfield was the movie right. because he would take those scenes and he would make them real to people. And, uh, and that's what they needed because they had no, no, uh, you know, no movies to go to. And so he really took it to them and it, and it impacted um, everybody. So when you went to Whitfield Revival, what was that like? And I specifically want you to tell the story of, of Nathan Cole. Tell me about that. It was electric. It was exciting. There was anticipation. Mm. And uh, it's a great story. I mean, businesses shut down, courts shut down, farms shut down, and everyone, they went to the revival. Nathan Cole, he was a young man and um, a rider, almost like a town crier, would go out and say, Whitfield's preaching, Whitfield's preaching. He's preaching at uh, 10 a.m. in the courthouse. And so Nathan dropped what he was doing in the field. It was eight o'clock in the morning. He'd likely been up since four. Right. And he ran inside, he gets his, his wife and they get on a horse and they rush and, and they drive for a um, whole hour, 12 miles into the, into the town. But it's, but it's so interesting because the horse got tired. He had to rest and uh, walk a bit. But he said, I saw a cloud um, over the town. But as he got closer, it wasn't a, 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 a cloud at all. Uh, of mist, it was a cloud of dust. Mm. There was a traffic jam and hundreds and hundreds of horses and carriages of people rushing in to hear the evangelist. He said um, he had to wait for a gap almost in the traffic to get in. So he gets in there and the anticipation is so high. And he said it was like the voice of an angel who spoke to him. And, um, and, and as with many thousands of, of people, he was touched. By that. He said, I look back on the farms and they were empty. Right. The power of the Word of God, he knew how to, how to relay that. But you talked about him spending time on his knees and the Word yeah. and the sermons would jump out at him. Yeah. You know, that's something that we, we live in such a immediate society. And I know we've said this for my whole life, you know, we almost cursed microwaves when they came out because they were too quick. And, um, you know, the, the, there's nothing like getting on your knees and seeing what God has to say oh, to you, yeah. hearing Him. So as he's preaching, um, what, kind of, what kind of messages would he actually preach? He preached on everything. Now, of course, he preached the message, I think, over 3,000 times, and that was, you must be born again. But um, there's a great one when he was, um, he was out preaching and, um, and, and he would get up and say, who is there in heaven besides Abraham? Are there Episcopalians in heaven? And the crowd would say, no. Are there only Methodists? No. Are there Congregationalists? And, he would, I mean, he would, and, and, and the crowd was there and he said, no, only those who have overcome by the blood of the lamb and the word of their, of their testimony. He said, let us not use labels uh, and let us say we are just Christians. And I think that he really, he, he unified unintentionally, I think, all these, all these different uh, groups and states un, um, under one, it was, un, it was a nation under God rather than individual states under their, uh, under their denomination. Because like uh, even in Pennsylvania, it was founded by William Penn and he was a Quaker. Right. So it's like uh, the flavor was we're Christian first and it birthed an identity, I think, of, of the whole nation that was to come. Now Whitfield, um, and I may be getting ahead of myself here a little bit, he, he lived to be an old man. Did he or did he die early? I think he died too young. He was 56 That's years old. Young. Now, his friend uh, Wesley was like 88. So what was the difference between Wesley 
living to 88 and Whitfield only going to 56. It was not spiritual. It wasn't a God thing that he was called home early. Whitfield, he got what he said. He said, I would, I would rather wear out than rust out. He did not uh, take care of himself. He kept a very punishing uh, schedule. I mean, he, he would sometimes, he would preach all day. He would ride all night and then preach again. Here's just a, a, uh, a nine day excerpt of, um, um, of his life. It said, he visited the sick, the, the imprisoned, he entertained um, um, with guests. He was, in, he was in, in Pennsylvania. He dined with William Penn's heir. He prayed with many individuals. Uh, he was a man, he loved you know, to go. The, the worst moments of his life was those three years mm -hmm. that he spent on the, on the ships. He said, I faced the devil on those times because he hated when he was not uh, uh, moving around. So yes, he died young. I think if he had looked after himself, he would, you know, uh, he would have had many more years, but um, he packed a lot of years, you know, um, a lot of life in those years. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and I know uh, we've learned that even for in later times with Americans who died early. Yes. Yeah. Like Jack Coe died at 38. Yeah. You know, yeah, and yeah. so there's, you know, running their bodies into the ground. Well, and you said earlier in the other program about 18,000 messages. Yeah. You know, uh, Oral Roberts said, I have 50 messages. <laughs> and, and, and his whole point was not that I don't have a lot of messages, just that it, you know, you preach and he would constantly tweak and add and, you know, change them. But the, the, the result is knowing what God has given you to speak. Yeah. What, and, and Whitfield seemed to know. Yes. Now let me just take a little break right here and talk about his, because we talked about his body and the fact he only lived to be 56 and um, which is very young, by the way, the, uh, the, the ability to, uh, your, your human body, you're still in the natural state. You have this supernatural gift. You have God living inside of you and you're, you're taking the gospel to the world. I mean, which Whitfield certainly did. And, um, <clears throat> You know, I can tell you, even in my own life, when there was a meeting I did where there was like a great results, uh, or uh, even attending a believers convention where there was such power and things were happening and it's over and all you can think of is, let's go to the next one. <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. let's hurry up and get to the next thing. Let's yeah. do the next one. Or, man, we had great healing. Let's, and we get, it's real easy to step over into the flesh and go, let's go another week. You know, just because you're the addictiveness of what the Holy Spirit does in your life. And, and it's such a wonderful thing. You know, our human bodies don't want to be apart from Him because yeah. it's, it's coming home to the Father. But we have to learn, and, and the only way you can get this is through the understanding of the Holy Spirit and through the Scripture that too, you do have to take care of your body here on earth yeah. to fulfill the call of God in your life. Whitfield was a wonderful Wonderful man. There's so many more stories. Let's let's get into a little bit more of that. Let's go back to his sermons. What was the immediate reaction when uh, he was preaching in America? Was was he? Uh, you talked about some of the uh, the people were coming. Was it that way everywhere he went? That I mean, people would he would have big crowds. He would have a remarkable thing happened many many times. Because if you have thousands of people, there's noise right. and there's things going on. But uh, here, Gene, it was often, it was silence. It was just pure silence. And, and it is rumored that he preached to 20, even 30,000 uh, people. And, uh, but the silence certainly helped that. But I think it was more than that. It was just, you know, I mean, I've been in services where, where you can cut the presence of God with a knife, there's the heavenly silence. I think it was more than just a natural mm -hmm. thing. Absolutely, it had to be yeah, to yeah, have the results yeah, that yeah, way. Yeah. Benjamin Franklin was pretty skeptical, wasn't he? Yeah, I mean, I mean to be honest, I was too. It's like, are you kidding me? I mean, I mean, thirty thousand people. How about three hundred? Right. I mean, um, no microphone and no amplification and all the noise outside. So, so, so it's a great story. Franklin is um, in Pennsylvania. He's listening to Whitfield and so he's skeptical but he's the scientist of course you know so he walked away as far as he could from where Whitfield was preaching 
and he did a calculation. He kind of drew an arc and thought, well, there's the preacher, I'm here. And if I drew an arc, you know, like an auditorium, right. if I give everyone like two foot by two foot, it wasn't 20,000 who could hear. He calculated that 30,000 could mm. hear that man preach. I mean, that changed me. I, I thought, man, that's true. That's not just wow. preaching, you know. That's facts. Yeah, yeah, that's facts. That's right. That's right. Which is great. Uh, how did, you know, Franklin, he was, and, and most of us don't know, didn't know that, I'm sure you, maybe you didn't ever heard that uh, uh, Benjamin Franklin had such an interest in Whitfield and what he was doing. Um, so was Franklin a Christian or what did he believe? Well, he was, uh, um, uh, Franklin, he called himself a, a deist. And a deist was a man who believed that God's there, but he doesn't involve himself in the affairs of man. So praying is useless. Mm. So he called him that, but he wasn't really because he believed in prayer. And at the time of the revolution, he encouraged the people to pray and invoke God, invite God into their uh, a, a, a affairs. So... We don't know if he became a Christian. I remember when uh, Franklin was becoming famous as a scientist, of course, he flew his kite in, into a, right. a thunderstorm. Always remember that, you know, that. And Whitfield, he wrote to him and said, I would now humbly recommend to your diligent, un, un, unprejudiced pursuit and study of the mystery of the new birth. So he's saying, study the new birth. And we don't know that, um, you know, that he became a, a Christian, but he greatly appreciated the, f the fruit of the new birth. Right. I mean, the change. There's a wonderful experience here. This was in 1739, um, uh, and this is Franklin. He said this, it was, it was wonderful to see the, uh, the change that was, in, that was made in the behavior of our inhabitants from being thoughtless or indifferent about religion. It seemed as if the whole world was growing religious so that one could not walk through town in an evening without hearing psalms sung in, in different families. So, man, he loved to see the he fruit of revival. He was, yeah, he was seeing the fruits of the revival. Absolutely, and he believed in it. You know, there, there are several uh, revivals where something happened with a child did something huge. Yeah, because we think it's just the big evangelist, that, you know, the Great Awakening, but there was many thousands of small. And this, this a, a mother, she was born again, and, uh, and she was trying to share the excitement of that with all her friends, and she may have not been good at it, and she was frustrated because no one wanted to hear her. But her daughter, her 10-year-old daughter, she got saved and just was full of joy and said, Mom, I want to tell the whole world this. Um, pray, let me run to some of the neighbors and tell them that they'd be happy and love my, my Savior too. And so, and, and the mother said, I don't know, I've tried that and it, and it didn't work. But this 10-year-old, she went to a shoemaker and she was quite blunt, she said, you need to be saved, otherwise you're going to be lost and without God. And amazingly, the tears just started to pour down this man's uh, faith. So it's not a great evangelist now, it's a 10-year-old girl, and he was saved. And 50 people were born again, just a result of that. So it was more than the great man of God. It was just people just sharing what happened in their lives. Mm. Yeah. What, what about some of his messages with, um, how did the other pastors receive him when he was preaching? When, especially when he's talking about the new birth. Yeah, he was the talk of the town and, and, the t and in the taverns too. And um, he was very dramatic. And so they didn't like his style and they didn't like what he said. Again, they struggled over, over this this whole thing of the new birth. I mean, I mean, to us, it's obvious. You start and you get born again. Right. But, 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 but these guys had years of religious life. And so um, he was shut out of the churches, even in the, the colonies often. So it wasn't, was it just the pastors that gave him a hard time? or was Oh, it? man, no. I mean, there were individuals who were just trying to cause uh, uh, problems. There's a great story here. There's a, a, a gentleman, he was called John... Uh, Morant, he was a freed um, African-American. He was, he was a French horn player. Right. So he'd walk past a meeting house where Whitfield was 
and, and, and there's a lot of noise going on. And he said, what's going on in there? And his friend said, oh, they're just hallooing in there. You know, they're just crazy guys. So this guy said, I'm going to stir up a bit of trouble here. I'm going to go in and blow my French horn. So he pushes his way in. He pulls, off, you know, the, the French horn off his shoulder, just as if the elderly, um, when the elderly Whitfield looks at him and says, Amos 4.12, prepare to meet thy God, O Israel. This guy is knocked to the ground. Just, it's like the power of the word impacted him. And he said, when he got up, he said it was fight. It was like the words of Whitfield were like swords that pierced him, but in a good way. Oh. And he was transformed. There's another great example of a man in a bar and they were all mimicking the preacher. Right. You know, and, and you know, he did, because he, he, uh, he would jump around, he'd cry often. And so they thought that was hilarious. It was free entertainment. Sure. So this man gets up and says, I can do this better than you all. So he gets up, he's handed the, the Bible and, uh, and um, it's a verse of scripture that says, repent and believe. So he just says, repent. And he can't speak. Wow. He, he just cannot speak. And so they're going, well, come on, come on. I thought you were good at doing this and stuff. And he went home and he wept and he became a believer. So, uh, yeah, there was a lot of controversy. So he was struck dumb right there in the... In yeah. The By reading, again, it's the power of the Word of God. Wow. I mean, I see that as a theme, don't you? I mean, for the yeah, whole lot. Absolutely. Tremendous. You know, and you're saying that, I remember uh, back in the early 1900s at Azusa Street, those that would, um, they weren't trying to necessarily mock him, right. but maybe they were not going to say what they should be saying, or they had something that, were, that they would either stop, forget what they were saying, and they're on their way to say something, or they would be, they couldn't talk. It's the same thing. That's they great. were struck dumb and couldn't talk. Yeah. And some would just even forget what they were supposed to bring up at all. You know, and they're like, oh, I don't know, I'll go sit down. So, yeah, right. um, amazing, and you're right, the Word of God, the power mm -hmm. of the Word of God in this, this man. Well, I'm sure that in the bar that converts were had that yeah, night. Yeah, right, yeah. <laughs> sure. <laughs> so, I, I'm just, oh my goodness. How did, uh, tell me about politics. In entering politics, that's a hot topic. It, you know, I mean, should we be completely outside or 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 kind of you know um, inside? He was called the accidental revolutionary because he really had such an impact on the revolution that was to come. Um, a piece of legislation in um, it was in in 1764 was passed in England. The 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 government there they just needed money because they had wars going on and different things. So they had a stamp act and every every page of printed paper was taxed. Well I mean the colonies were furious about this. Yes. So they sent Franklin to talk to a committee in the House of, of Commons and they asked him all kinds of questions about this. And But it was Whitfield as well. He was lobbying as well as Franklin and they got that retracted and repealed. And, um, and so the colonies really saw that, man, this evangelist, even though he's born in... in, in in England, um, he's, he's speaking on our behalf yeah. and he's one of us. And so that was a very important perception that happened. Sure, I'm sure it did. And you know, that's interesting, you know, that that was pre-revolutionary war. Yeah. And so would you call him a pre-revolutionist? Oh, there we go. Yeah, that's yeah. great. <laughs> so that he actually opened the door, you know, in a lot of, in a lot of ways to, uh, to the revolution because of what happened there. Yeah, because you know what? He'd seen this. He saw, and, and there's a quote here, that, um, I, mean, I mean, the passage of that act was, um, it was an attempt on the liberties of the colonies. He saw, in, in, um, as a young man in Protestant England, the non-Protestant European countries were trying to squelch and, 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 and to put away with that and impose their version of Christianity. There was a seven-year war. And so he came over 
uh, to um, the colonies and he saw the British government were doing that. Right. And it really struck a chord in him that we must have freedom to defend um, you know, our religion. And as the, the British government had taken up arms to defend their Protestant Christianity, I think he saw the writing on the wall and that the colonies would have to do that. I, um, I believe that, Eugene, Dean. Real, real quickly, because I only got like a couple minutes, tell me about the Boston Massacre in 1770. What did, what did, how, what did he do about that? Yeah, I mean, he was preaching. And that was when the British troops had, um, um, had killed like five individuals. They were throwing insults. And someone said that snowballs were thrown, you know, but, but these troops open fired and uh, it was a big deal. But Whitfield, as soon as he heard about it, he ran, no, well, he, um, he got on his horse and he went to Boston and he comforted the families. So his heart is drawn to these guys who are almost right. being picked on by these big bullies. It's so interesting. Well, Doug, we, we haven't even gotten into we're still not done with Whitfield. No, I it, believe There's it. so many stories, but what a wonderful, wonderful man to study. I, I want to encourage you to go, go study Whitfield out yourself. Read some of it. There's plenty of written material. Go to the website, revivalradiotv.com, and go to the timeline. And on that timeline, you can see different things. You have There's some links that you can read about Whitfield, and you can kind of see what all that he did and his connection. You know, that was 1700s. Now, it's interesting to remember Whitfield in the late 1700s that we kind of skipped over what happened in the Great American Prayer Revival, 1759, that went on right while he's there. So you can see when you start overlaying what things happened where and when, you see, ah, this was God's great tapestry of how things all fit together. And it's just amazing. I know... I know that you would you want to read more, so go to the website and see more about it. Thanks, Doug. You know, what is our part today? What should we do in the last 30 seconds? What is our part to do when it comes to the story of, of uh, Whitfield? We can only give what we have. And you might say, well, I don't have, I'm not a big evangelist, I'm not big this, I'm just old me. Have you been born again? Right. Wow. You, then you can g give that. Has God spoken to you or touched uh, your life? Then just give what you have. Don't think I don't have something, is give what you do have. Right, and that's what we mean when we say, be the one. See you next time.